right, everybody, we're live streaming here. This is Tom Dutta. I am the host of the Quiet Warrior Show. We're live streaming on LinkedIn, Facebook, and YouTube. And I want to ask you to go and find my YouTube feed and subscribe. You'll be able to get the release of this premiere when it uh, releases in the near future. We're also going to be released as an international podcast. So wherever you find your podcast, find the Quiet Warrior Show, and you'll be ready to receive it when it comes out. I'm excited today to welcome to the show from North Vancouver, British Columbia, Sue Hall. Sue, welcome to the show. Thank you very much indeed. Pleasure to be here, truly. Yeah, there's something special about you to me. I'm just going to tell the guests how I met you, and then we'll get into your story. First of all, Sue lives in North Vancouver, and we were just riffing offline that I grew up. Uh, my first job was probably a couple blocks from where Sue was when I was a young fellow uh, working in one of the banks up there. And Sue did something amazing this year. She completed her first, uh, I think it was your first TED, TEDx talk at TEDx Bear Creek Park. So, Sue, congratulations. Uh, that's that's amazing to me. And well, we met through that process because most of my fans know that I did one a couple years, about a year ago. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about Sue's background and then Sue will get into a conversation. Uh, she is the founder of the, I'm just trying to find my notes here, the founder of the whole Dyslexic Society uh, to, since 2001. Uh, she's for the past 22 years been working with dyslexic children and adults. That's just amazing. And she's a co-host of a podcast series and her first book, which I chuckled when I saw the title, Fish Don't Climb Trees. And then I read it cover to cover and found it unbelievable what, what she taught me in that. So, Sue, it's great to have you on the show. Why don't we get right into it? To, you know, a lot of people know this is a story of just your life, where you started, how you got to what you're doing. Tell us where it began and and uh, and take us up to the point of discovering that you have dyslexia. Well, thank you, Tom. Um, I um, didn't do too badly in school. Um, I worked very hard. I, I got through it. Um, I was actually fine with reading and spelling. Uh, math was my downfall. But when I went to school, number one, dyslexia really wasn't a thing. And number two, girls didn't really have to be good at math in those days. So that was uh -huh. quite a refreshing <laughs> thing for me. Um, and I I, want, I never wanted to go to university. I just had this feeling it wasn't for me. I wanted to get a job as a secretary so I could work anywhere. I wanted to travel. And, uh, and that's what I did. And I never discovered this world of learning challenges until my son was struggling in school. And um, I knew that this very bright young little guy um, who loved learning just wasn't enjoying himself at all. Well, thanks for sharing that. And by the way, thanks for being vulnerable. I know you've done this now for 21 years and for uh, there's a bit of a connection, the thread in my lifeline that at age 20, I think I was 21, Sue, that I was working downtown Vancouver in an office tower. Uh, people know it today as Park Place Tower. And it was my first management role in my, my young career. And a gentleman walked in by the name of Ron, and he was a trial lawyer. And he came in just to borrow some money at that point. And he sat down and we started talking. And I learned quickly that he was successful, but he had dyslexia. And he explained that to me. And throughout his career, he was one of the best at what he did. But I remember going to his office one day and seeing how he was organizing himself. And he told me, he said, I have a, he said, I, I owe a lot to my assistant who, who helps me stay organized. But I have to be honest with you, at that time, I didn't understand dyslexia. And what you taught me in your book, uh, which will get you to talk about a lot, of, there's a lot of myths about it. Uh, I assume people who have it are learning disabled and that there is something that, you know, they could never uh, really manage until I read your book. Uh, my heart grew when I read your book and I heard about your son and watching your TED Talk. Everybody, you have to go see the TED Talk. Uh, it's TEDx Bear Creek Park. It just came out. You did a great job. But uh, one of the things I, I always say is people who are heroic in my eyes, uh, there's many people who have children who have challenges with learning. We know this. One of my uh, children did. Uh, but how many parents actually take that as a as a purpose and a mission uh, and do something with it and uh, you have so get us back into the story tell us help us understand uh, this thing I smiled when you said university wasn't for me I uh, wanted to travel uh, that kind of was like yeah that was me a little bit as well I think a lot of people but uh, what is dyslexia uh, just tell us more 
about that. And you said, uh, we are learning able. What does that mean? Well, um, I'm just trying to figure out which, which way I should go. Um, I'll, I'll finish the little story with, with okay. George, if I may. And then um, it, was, it was just really obvious that he was very uncomfortable at school. Um, he went to a special school um, and basically they just gave him more of what he couldn't do already. And it was just a puzzle to me. I had no background in education whatsoever. I literally just a mom who was watching her very bright child struggle. So um, it didn't make any sense to me to keep giving him more of what he couldn't do already. So long story short, we discovered a book called The Gift of Dyslexia by Ron Davis. Yeah. And took one of these programs and it made such a difference to him uh, at the age of 10 Tom he said to me at the end of this program he said mom dyslexia is like a wound in the past they gave me band-aids for it but now I can heal it myself and I don't think there's a mom out there who wouldn't do something if they heard their child say that and I thought well if it's made such a difference to him I'd really like to be able to deliver these programs myself and so I trained to become a facilitator and it wasn't until I was in the middle of my training that I thought to myself hang on a minute I think I can do this and and so I discovered that I have this way of thinking too and, and what this is um, dyslexics have a natural ability to alter perception and what that means is that we can imagine things that are three-dimensional yeah and we can close our eyes and we can keep that image still but the part of us that's doing the looking we can move around the image we can see that image from any angle and the funny thing is when you can do that you would obviously assume everybody can do that because if you think a certain way you just automatically assume everybody thinks like that but not everybody does and the people who have this ability are often brilliant athletes and designers and entrepreneurs because they can literally see things from lots of different angles. It's yeah. their perception, right, that is this beautiful gift. But if you use this gift in the two-dimensional world of print and say I have a lowercase d on my hand and then I start seeing that d from 180 degrees, it becomes a p. Wow. And so this beautiful gift that we have in the 3D world works against us in the 2D world of print. That's fascinating. Everybody, I'm going to mention the Sue's book. Uh, Sue, can you hold it up there? Mine's on its way. There it is. Fish don't climb trees. Uh, you, know, you know, when like I said, I chuckled at the uh, at the the title, but when I give it back to you, just tell us about. There was a little quote in there. I wrote it down in my notes. I, I just didn't bring it today. About. Uh, what that metaphor fish don't climb trees you explained it in a, a beautiful way i think there was some einstein in it but anyway uh so thank you for holding that up uh everybody when i was reading sue's book and sue one of the things that blew my mind was i really i read a statement that said suggested that maybe a third of people might have some form of uh this uh dyslexia and the more I read your book, the more I started wondering if I have some of that because I've been told that I'm a, vi well, I know I've done a learning skills assessment, which I teach in my executive coaching practice. My background is an, pay an executive and now I coach others. And I've been told that I can jump from quadrant to quadrant in my brain, almost three dimensional. I also in the learning skills so found out that I'm a visual learner primarily. And I never used to admit it because I was embarrassed, especially being a CEO at one point. I'd sit in a room. But my father, when and my dad passed away uh, in 2018, I love that. He used to read books and he used to say, I can't finish books because words bounce around on the page. And then as I grew up, I started reading and I turned to audio books because words bounced around on the page. And I could never get through a page and even studying for school. I had to work really hard. I was an A student, but, and then when I went into business and I'll finish with this and give it back to you, I would sit in a room, for example, uh, say a board meeting, and I would have to explain financial statements and information. And if I had a picture up, it was a lot easier for me. Uh, so you had this uh, thing in the book about a PC and a Mac. Just take us in any way deeper into this because it's fascinating. You've, you've told us about the visual piece and not everybody thinks that way. Tell us more. 
Well, um, the Einstein quote that you're talking about is everyone is a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will grow up its whole life believing it is stupid. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> that was the quote, right? And my son found the quote and he said, I really like this one, mom. And I said, that's the title for my book, Fish Don't Climb. Oh. So that was how that came about. Yeah. When it comes to one third of the population, the official figure is 10 to 15%. But obviously, they're the children and adults who get tested. And I will absolutely guarantee you that for every one child or adult that's tested, there is going to be one that isn't tested um, because the testing is limited, obviously, um, to, to what the schools can cope with and what parents can afford. So um, there's a wonderful lady called Dr. Linda Silverman who wrote Upside Down Brilliance. And she's estimated that it's at least one third of the population who have this beautiful gift. Yeah. Uh, of being able to alter perception. Um, you mentioned um, something that made me write down 32 images a second. We think so fast that we, we are able to cope with 32 images a second, which is a subliminal um, ability. Well, yeah, I, I, was, I, I remember reading something about that in the book. And the other thing that I, I jumped out at me was, it was fascinating about how certain words, when you read them like the, you, 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 there's no picture for the, did I get that right? Exactly. Uh, so so that, that, yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> so Go ahead. my, my, um, my sort of um, three parts to dyslexia, if you like, first of all, is this wonderful ability to alter perception. Secondly, um, we are the, the PCs in a, in a no, uh, that's wrong. We are the Apple Macs in a PC world yeah. because our education system was designed by the PC computers, if you like, and we just happen to be the Apple Mac computers. And there is nothing wrong with our computer. It just works on a different system. Um, and then the third part is that um, we do uh, need pictures for the meaning of every word that we read because we're picture thinkers. And so if I read bicycle, I'll see one. And if I read book, I'll see a picture for that. But if I read the or if or of, there's no picture, which means that my thinking has just gone blank. So it's like there's a picture, then it's blank. There's a picture, then it's blank. If we were in a movie theater where the film was doing that, we would not stay in that no. theater. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> we I'd would be... go for the one that's always working, which is called our imagination. And then yes. the kids get accused of daydreaming and not paying attention. And fair play, we didn't give them enough to focus right yeah absolutely i want to ask you this uh, sue I'm learning so much from me everybody this is a teaching moment about what sue just said i mean if 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 you have a child or if you even yourself now i mean watch this and learn from sue read the book that there's even a nugget of something that you say that geez out's me then look further into it because what by a by looking into myself when I read the book about these things we're talking about, I, uh, I challenged myself to do something to pursue it uh, because, you know, I want to be able to overcome that part of my, my learning. One of the uh, questions I always have in my mind about any thing that's labeled as a disability, I mean, I don't get me going on this, but I have uh, my same friend I mentioned has a child and they, you know, they labeled him with ADHD and then it's medication. And with all the information and evidence, since you've been doing this work with the whole dyslexic society, why, why is it still not, why is the school system or the education system still not getting this or am I being unfair? Because the way they're be the way my kids are have, were taught, and you know, it hasn't changed. Everybody's in this the room being taught the same way. No, it hasn't changed. Um, and I think if we if we go back to that analogy of the PCs and the Apple Max, um, the the PCs um, invented the system. They were they they the PCs computer, if you like, thinks with sound. They're very phonic in their reading instruction. They're very linear and sequential and organized. And they were the ones who created the education system in the first place. Um, and the Apple Macs are much more visual, they're feeling based, they have an internal film um, and uh, not always quite so organized. So um, if you do well in the PC system, there's a very good chance that you'll end up in university. You may even end up teaching um, because that system worked for you and you love it and you think that it's absolutely perfect and you keep perpetuating it. Um, so the, the obvious um, 
thought for that for that system is that because we don't thrive in it there must be something wrong with us and so we get educational psychology assessments and they judge us they use that pc um, system as the standard that we should be able to um to to be part of but we we are not part of that standard we are the well, there's absolutely nothing wrong with our brains whatsoever. We just don't learn the way we're taught. Yeah, no, that's amazing. And so I, I was just thinking now about the the whole dyslexic society. And then uh, we mentioned as we introduced you a Davis Dyslexia Correction Facilitator. Uh, t so what happens next? Tell us about that work. So, so say you're working with my son. I'm not suggesting my son has dyslexia. I don't know. Maybe he does. But what happens next when you start working with a child? Well, when we discover that somebody has this ability to alter perception, when we know they know they have challenges, and when we know they want to do something about them, um, then we cope with all those three elements. We, we give them a way of controlling their perception so that they have um, a method of lining up their perception with their reality. So they're, we, we call this part of us that's doing the looking, we call it the mind's eye. Yeah. And um, if we give it a sort of parking spot, if you like, at the, uh, above and behind our head, then it will have the same view as our real eyes. So that, that gives the person total control of their perception. And they'll notice that when their perception and their reality agree, they can focus perfectly well. Um, the second part of it is when it comes to uh, reading instruction, we uh, make sure that we use a sort of form of spell reading, if you like. Yep. We don't use phonics. We, they spell the words out to us. We tell them what they are. So it works just fine. It's just their way of, of being able to read. And when it comes to those little words, we get them to look the word up in the dictionary. They make a model with plasticine clay of the meaning of the. They make the letters the. And then they've got everything they need. Every word has three parts to it the meaning, the spelling, and how you say it. And if you have all those three in the manner that you need them, it's not a problem. You can spell just as well as anybody else. Uh, that's, that's so exciting. I'm just writing notes madly here on my paper about that. I'm going to go get some plasticine. I mean, this is, you, can have, you can have fun with this. <laughs> uh, so I, I want to... I want to humanize this now. I know through the book there, you talk about uh, some of the students or some of the experiences. Uh, Give us give us a story. You don't have to con break confidentiality of of just one of the breakthroughs. Maybe you remember with a student and and how you it changed your life. The other part I want you to talk about, if you can, is mental health, because I know going through school, uh, some children who have limitations, and I had my own. They were different. Uh, there's some. I'm a big advocate for mental health, but there's a lot of shame and uh, guilt associated with it. There's a lot of bullying and things that occur. So while we're going through this curve of, you know, learning that we're not, we're learning and able, uh, we also have to deal with this parallel track of, you know, am I, am I good enough, right? So just give us a heartwarming story, maybe something that gives us hope. Well, um, one of the, the stories that I, I mentioned in the TEDx, um, when an adult came to see me who um, had, just discovered that she may have dyslexia um, and she it was it was very interesting when she came to to see me the very first time I don't think I said anything for about 45 minutes she just had, she was one of those people who had to offload before she could upload yeah. and um, she was just devastated to find out that she now had dyslexia and she'd struggled all her life and she dealt with her struggles by uh, self-medicating from 14 with alcohol and pills and drugs and um, she just went down a very dark road um, at the age of 22 she got herself sober and um, she was able to to start studying um, in the field that she wanted to study um, but of course the studying was difficult because she unearthed this discovery that she had dyslexia so she took her program and um, it was um, just one aha moment after another um, where she discovered that she could read um, perfectly well. She could um, spell the words that she needed. She could study by taking notes in a visual form. And um, she she qualified for her her route in, in a sort of um, slightly medical profession. 
Yeah. What a heartwarming story. And everybody, there's a teaching moment. So just listen to the threads in that story. What I heard was this was somebody who was giving up on themselves and believing they weren't right with learning, uh, used alcohol to medicate. And how many times have we heard that, whether it's dyslexia or other things? And dude, was able to break through with the work that you did with them. That's amazing. Hold the book up again, Sue. I just want to plug it again. Everybody, we're talking to Sue Hall about the book Fish Don't Climb Trees, uh, the whole a whole new look at dyslexia. And thank you, Sue. Uh, I want you to get a hold of this book, everybody, and I also want uh, to recommend that you read it and you post a review on Amazon or Goodreads. How we get uh, authors uh, uh, stories out there is is really by by doing reviews, getting their work known, and being a fellow author, Sue. Uh, I'll be posting a review for your book once I, I am able to do that shortly. Let's go into uh, another part of this, which is the, the 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 book that you mentioned somebody else's name in another book that you had uh, read. Can you just mention what that was? Ron Davis, yeah. um, the gentleman who wrote The Gift of Dyslexia. And it was his discovery actually 40 years ago um, that uh, prompted him to bring to, to put these programs together to be able to help people um, wow. the gift of dyslexia and then he wrote the gift of learning an amazing wonderful man who is dyslexic himself yeah and um, to me that makes the whole difference yeah that, uh, yeah the, uh, how did you meet him well um when I discovered that my son was struggling um I wanted something different and I saw this uh, talk which was called the gift of dyslexia well when you put gift and dyslexia together it's a bit of an unusual yeah. um, juxtaposition so I thought gift finally something positive <laughs> right and I right. went to listen to it and I that was given by one of his um, team and uh, so I discovered his programs and lucky me um, he was still doing the teaching when I trained to be a facilitator yeah, uh, I'm just, you know, they say, you know, if you saw the movie The Grinch Who Stole Christmas, where the heart grew three times before he went down into Whoville. <laughs> it's one of my favorite scenes. I, uh, my heart's been growing here every time you're speaking and I'm thinking about this because now, you know, the, I learned uh, in brain science studying it, there's something called the, I think, reticular activating system. And basically, if I all of a sudden close my eyes and opened it and I, said i'm going to focus on red things all of a sudden i see a lot of red things and apparently it's a part of our brain that blocks out billions and billions of bits of data and and focuses on what what we want and it's funny once i started reading your book and learning a, a whole bunch of stories started coming back to me sue about people i'd met just in the last two years and this whole subject of dyslexia came to my mind and through i can't tell you who it is for confidentiality i don't think he'd want me to but I uh, mentioned to you I have a, had a brain injury from a slip and fall in the bathtub in 2018. And I ended up, uh, I had to get past my ego so I can talk about it. But, you know, I was a CEO and I ended up being a night stalker at Costco for, for, for two years and literally going and lifting boxes of produce, keeping my body active because my doctor said, you know, I've slipped into depression and if you don't do something, Tom, it's it's not going to be good for you. And through my travels, I met somebody there who became a mentor. But one day we were at a computer and they're showing me, writing some things for me and the letters were backwards and they opened up and told me I didn't do, do good in school and they were really down on themselves. And I said, there's nothing wrong with that. I said, you know, there's probably some some ways you can work through that. And I, I remember asking, have you ever done anything, you know, to look into that? And so that that's where my heart broke because that individual now is, is uh, higher up and more responsibility, but they believe that, you know, they're, they're, they'll, they'll never learn right. So I'm gonna pass your book on to, 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 to them and uh, certainly, use this show to get the word out. I think you've just cracked open a whole topic here that my network will appreciate. Uh, as we move to if, uh, wrapping up with a few more things here, tell me about the book. Why did you write it? I mean, there's a lot of people saying I'm going to write a book. And as you know, not everybody does, but what inspired you to write the book? Well, um, I keep a record of everybody's programs and sometimes my students share the most amazing things with me. They have these gifts that nobody would really believe and they have these abilities that are quite um, incredible. And um, I thought, well, hang on a minute. Um, nobody's ever going to know about these unless I put them on paper. 
and so I started to to do that and uh, it turned into a story about um, my discovery my son's discovery um, their stories and then I finished the book up by showing what the problems are at the moment in our education system and what I think we can do to solve them um, but going back to um, something you said about the gift um, we need to get it out there that well, there's absolutely nothing wrong with our brains. We are totally capable of learning the way we were born to learn. And if we use our gift to its full advantage, we have these incredible um, gifts uh, in terms of, as I say, athleticism and design and entrepreneurship and uh, so many areas. So many people in the trades are amazing carpenters because they have this way of thinking. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think I think that's a big big part of where I'm I'm going in my mind with this. That there's a you mentioned gifts, but there's a lot of people out there that now I I know might have dyslexia uh, because of my experience with them that have many gifts. But you know, sometimes when we think we have limitations, we just give up and we never express those gifts, and it's a loss to to the world. So that's pretty outstanding. I just want to mention uh, off your bio here for everybody's benefit. You know, you mentioned about getting the word out. You know, Sue's, Sue's done many things, professional development day sessions and presentations, contributing to conferences, webinars. You've appeared on global TV, taken part in CKNW Telethon, interviewed on radio, Vancouver Sun, Globe and Mail being featured. So you're doing a lot. And what I'm going to ask the, those who see this interview to do is is help help multiply that in any way by getting a hold of you, by getting the book and by finding others. Uh, who will, could be touched by this gift. And uh, so why don't you tell us, as we move to wrap up here, where people can get a hold of you and the book? Well, thank you. Um, the book has its website, www.fishdontclimbtrees.com. Okay. Uh, the, um, the whole Dyslexic Society is www.thewds.org. And um, I'm also Sue Hall at positivedyslexia.com. Um, so and and views on YouTube would be fantastic for the TEDx. That I, I every morning I go to YouTube and see how <laughs> it's, it's just so exciting. <laughs> yeah, for for everybody, the, well, you know, for those who don't know, YouTube when the, te, the Sue's video was put up on. So just so you know, when you do a TED talk, your video has to go to TEDx New, TED New York, the uh, the mothership. It has to be vetted and approved and then put on the platform, but. Uh, YouTube needs, it has analytics that track how many times people watch it. They also track, and I know this from my own experience, Sue, that they track duration of watch. So everybody, if you watch it, Sue's talk or any of these uh, YouTubes, finish it. Uh, and then they pick it up and then they recommend it in their feeds. So Sue, we're going to push you over the top and we're going to we're going to put that in the show notes, all of the links that you've given me and uh, the TEDx. And, uh, you know, we're going to make sure that people uh, know about your story uh, in steroids. This is now a legacy. So I want to honor you with a few things as I wrap up here. And I do this for all of my guests. Uh, I surprise them unless you've listened to a lot of my shows. You don't know that we're inducting you into what's called the Quiet Warrior Tribe with an award. And so let me just uh, sort of ask you to look at my screen. And if for those listening to the podcast, you won't see this, but the YouTube premiere video, you will. Behind me is an image. And this is actually called a challenge coin. And these were originated in World War I. And uh, I had these handcrafted and painted, created. Uh, and on the front of the coin is an image of the show art for the show. And on the back of it is a beautiful illustrated image of the hero's journey narrative by Joe Campbell, which is really about somebody who discovers a limitation or has some challenges, overcomes it, comes back as a teacher and a guide to change the world in some way. And that is you. So there's uh, probably a hundred and probably less than 50 coins a year that go out into the world. We're in now 12, 13 countries. And by receiving this coin, you commit to continuing your amazing work of purpose uh, using what your gift is to change the world. And just know as you carry it, you put it in your pocket or in your office that there's quiet words all over the world that now are connected to you by by a common thread. So welcome to the tribe. <laughs> so, um, that's amazing. Thank you so very, very much. That's a big honor. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. It'll take a bit of time for me to get it to you, but they come in a cherry box and uh, and uh, that'll be happening soon. The last thing I want to say is this came to me and it doesn't happen often. Uh, we ju I just launched a major uh, book award 
and we're going to be doing some PR on it later in the year. It's called the QW Literary Award, and I have a big, hairy, audacious goal attached to it, and that we are looking to rival it with the likes of a Nobel Prize. It will be the first book award program that will have a test of character. So that's all I'm going to tell you because it, there's nothing like it. And so I'm going to encourage you, and I'll send you out a note on this at some point, to apply to receive that. Uh, we have a committee and a whole process set up. We're only going to uh, bring four books a year into that list. And, uh, and then we'll do a short video and induct you on it. But this list will be looked at around the world. That's my vision by learning institutions, by media everywhere when they want to find purposeful books of authors that actually walk the purpose. They didn't just write a book and talk about something. They actually took something in their life and they're making an impact on the world. So more on that soon. <laughs> such amazing work. Now, I did not know about this, but luckily on my desk, I happen to have, um, we have created a symbol for dyslexia. We're going to launch it this year. Oh. And it's a D, but it has a gift bow, right? And I, I researched, there's no, sorry, there's no um, universal symbol for dyslexia. So oh, I thought my. we're going to make one, which we did. And uh, we're going to launch it in August uh, together with a big fundraiser. Oh, so that is... That is an absolute gift to me and a surprise. So I'm going to open. I'm going to leave it open for you. That uh, once you've done that in any way, come back to the show. We can do a quick one on that, and uh, that's amazing. Well, you'll uh, be getting one of those. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, we we just uh, we just did something really cool today. So uh, so thank you for being on the show, and I know that we'll be uh, speaking to you again. Thank you so very very much. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. You're welcome. Will everybody find this show, as I said, on the, my YouTube channel and subscribe to it? When the YouTube premiere comes out, give it a rating so we can honor Sue's work. Find The Quiet Warrior Show on your favorite podcast channel and the same thing, honor Sue's interview by giving it a rating. And live life with your passion. Live the life that you deserve and desire with purpose like you see Sue Hall does. Thank you, Sue. Thank you so much. You're doing wonderful work. All right. Stand by. I'm going to end the broadcast.